the meeting is now being recorded. Great, thank you. Good morning, everyone. It is uh, 1128. Um, we are obviously running a bit behind in our uh, day two of our regular May board meeting of the State Bar Board of Trustees. I'm gonna call us to order yeah. in a second um, so that the secretary can take a roll. Uh, before I do that, let me just say thank you very much for your, for your patience. Uh, we know that this morning, this morning's agenda has uh, quite a few important issues on it, and we're looking forward to getting business started. So let's do that. Um, Madam Secretary, if you take the roll, I'd appreciate it. Rotten? Present. Chen? Here. Cisneros? Here. De La Cruz? Delen? Duran? Here. Leg? Oh, did you, did you say Seleg? Yes, Seleg. I'm here. Thank you. Shelby? Present. Soul? Present. Stallings? Here. Tony? Present. You have a quorum. Thank you, Madam Secretary. I understand that uh, there may be some technical difficulties with the video in one of our offices. So if you're going to, I see three Sean Selegs, um, which is which is a nice thing, but Mr. Seleg is only participating as one board member today. Um, do I get three votes? How exciting. You do not. Nice try though. <laughs> I, um, I will start by just letting folks know that um, we have the, the following remaining items on our agenda from yesterday. Item 701 is the proposed amendments to the final California Paraprofessionals Program Working Group recommendations and rules which we will start with momentarily. And item 710 is the SB 211 case processing standards update presentation, which we'll take up after uh, the paraprofessional item. After that, the board will convene into closed session to consider the items and I'll make the announcement at the appropriate time. As we get started, however, uh, since we're starting a new day, I do want to open up the floor to public comment um, on any of the items on our agenda or any item um, within the subject matter jurisdiction of the Board of Trustees. I see that we have a couple of hands raised already. Um, for those of you who are familiar with Zoom, you'll recognize the raise hand function at the bottom of your screen. If you're joining us by telephone only, you would raise your hand by pressing star nine, star six, star nine. Star six is mute and unmute. Um, and of course, the board as always encourages and welcomes uh, public comment and input on our items. Uh, I see that the, the attendees list is populating with raised hands. And so please feel free to do so um, as folks are speaking. And I will hand the floor over to the secretary to start the public comment, unless any member of the board has uh, questions, comments, or concerns before we start. Okay, seeing none, Madam Secretary. First, we have Stephen Fleischman. Stephen, your mic has been enabled and you have three minutes. Hi, I'm Steve Fleischman. I'm a partner at Horvitz and Levy in LA. I was a member of the paraprofessional working group. I'd like to comment on the financial aspects of the proposal. As the board knows, there was a similar program in Washington, which was canceled after five years at a cost of 1.4 million. The state bar now estimates that getting this program up and running will cost $2 million. On pages 28 and 29 of the Adels report, the state bar uh, recommended considering taking donations from um, the Gates Foundation, Google.org, and the Zuckerberg Initiative in order to pay the startup costs for the paraprofessional program. <clears throat> Obviously, there's great concern among members of the bar about the impact of technology on the practice of law, particularly as it relates to the ongoing sandbox group. I feel it would be highly inappropriate to take money from technology companies while at the same time trying to let technology companies um, practice law in California. I believe the only way this program should go forward is if the funding is uh, decided in advance through funding from the legislature. 
Um, there have been discussions about taking a $2 million loan from the general fund in order to fund this. However, you need to know how many people would need to sign up for the program to make the program sustainable and to pay back the $2 million, which of course could also be used for enforcement purposes. So I'd ask the board not to adopt this program until the financial aspects are taken care of. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Fleischman. Next, we have Jackie Serna. Jackie, your mic has been enabled and you have three minutes. Good morning, Mr. Chair and State Bar Board of Trustees members. I'm Jacqueline Serna, the Deputy Legislative Director for the Consumer Attorneys of California. Um, we submitted a written comment earlier this week with regard to this item, but I would like to briefly highlight just a few issues. We strongly support the revised dissents by um, the paraprofessional group members, Carolyn Shining and Steve Fleischman. So we would direct you to those um, points made in their excellent dissents. Secondly, we urge the Board of Trustees to consider two very important public comments that were submitted during the public comment period before taking any final action on these recommendations. The first being the letter from Attorney General Rob Bonta, dated January 12, 2022, and the second being the letter from the 24 legal aid organizations, including Public Counsel, Bedzetic, and others, dated January 7th where they explained their opposition to the program as a whole from a consumer legal perspective. We very much support the points made in those public comments. Um, like Mr. Fleischman, we are gravely concerned with the funding source still not being identified almost two years into this endeavor. And we would actually urge that any funding come from the state legislature to ensure that there's integrity and in um, auditing of it and oversight by the public by the by the legislature as it should be. And finally, we think that there this program is not ready to be enacted. It's not ready, it's not ready to go. And there needs to be further opportunity for public comment if any changes are made before this proposal is presented to the Supreme Court and to the legislature. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Serna. Next we have Ken Wang. Ken, your mic has been enabled and you have three minutes. Good morning, Mr. Chair and State Bar Trustee members. My name is Ken Wang and I'm the Policy Associate for the California Employment Lawyers Association. I'm commenting on item 701. SELA uh, is a statewide organization of over, over 1,200 attorneys who practice primarily employment law on behalf of workers. And we just want to align our comments with um, those of Jackie Serna uh, and of um, State Fleischman. Um, and we want to uh, strongly urge you to consider the revised dissents of Member Shining and Fleischman uh, and urge you to take seriously the concerns that they, along with the letters from the Attorney General Rob Bonta, as well as the 24 legal aid organizations have raised. While we commend the working group for rejecting non-lawyer ownership of law firms after extensive public comments opposing the proposal, the State Bar staff have made references to possible further changes before implementation of the program. Such changes should not be done without further public input and without this measure of transparency and accountability, we cannot support the board of trustees taking a vote on a report and recommendations that are not truly final. And finally, just a point on the funding source, we're really deeply concerned about the possible conflicts of interest arising from public private funding for a state bar run initiative. It's not a secret that these private tech based funding sources that have been mentioned have an interest in advancing its own profit motive through the provision of legal services in a regulatory sandbox in consideration uh, by the state bar. And the legislature should be the only funding source for this program and any similar state bar endeavors. Uh, that's the only way to ensure appropriate oversight, auditing, and public accountability. Thank you for considering these comments. Thank you, Mr. Wang. Next, we have Leigh Farron. Leigh, your mic has been enabled and you have three minutes. Thank you. Uh, good morning. My name is Leigh Farron. I'm the Director of Legal Services at the Public Law Center in Orange County. Um, I am providing a comment on the paraprofessionals working group. 
Um, can you hear me okay? It's, okay, I thought I heard someone else talking. Sorry about that. Um, I have followed the discussion of the proposal after receipt of the public comment, and I believe that the representation of the public comments received is skewed. For instance, the summary listed a number of groups labeled as consumer advocacy groups as in favor of the proposal. Um, I would argue that many, if not all, of the legal services organizations that commented are also consumer advocacy groups. As a legal services attorney, when I speak publicly, my role is to speak um, in, in, on behalf of my clients, not me personally. Um, ultimately, though, I think the overall issue is that there are still a number of concerns with the proposal, even as amended. Um, first, we believe the paraprofessional proposal is not necessarily the answer to the justice gap. The studies, more than anything else, show that there's an education gap, that Californians do not know when they have a legal problem. There's insufficient data to confirm that the appropriate solution is creating an entirely new licensee, rather than countless other alternative solutions that were never really considered or studied as possibilities. Um, some of those are community navigator programs, um, a program patterned off the provisionally licensed lawyer program or broad right to counsel advocacy. Um, beyond the threshold issue, we don't believe the paraprofessional proposal is an appropriate solution to solving the justice gap. We believe there are other flaws. Um, we believe attorney supervision should be required. We believe paraprofessionals should not be able to appear in court except for when under attorney supervision. And we believe that some of the subject matters approved for inclusion in the program are inappropriate and that there will be unintended consequences, including particularly issues of clients feeling forced to weigh federal claims or not understanding the availability of other possible relief because of the limitations of the paraprofessionals. The letter submitted by uh, the group of legal services organizations of which my organization was a part um, goes into much more detail and I won't continue on with that as I'm assuming y'all you all were able to review the um, the, the, the public comments. Um, I, we recognize the incredible amount of time and energy that the working group has put in. Um, and and I, I appreciate all of that. There was extensive conversations and meetings, I know. Um, but we we're, were concerned that the entire proposal is premised on an incorrect conclusion based on incomplete data. Um, we urge the board not to approve the advancement of the program at this time, but to continue exploring- have 30 seconds remaining. Thank you. Cost-effective, responsive solutions, bringing in additional key stakeholders. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Ms. Farron. Next, we have Daniel Faruzan. Daniel, your mic has been enabled and you have three minutes. Mr. Faruzan, are you with us? So we're not hearing you. I'm not sure if you're speaking. Why don't we Can try and- now? There you go. Okay. Okay. Thank I'll you. be quick. First and foremost, just want to thank you guys for taking the time to listen to us as attorneys. We do appreciate the state bar hearing us out. I'm the president of the West Side Bar Association organization that has over 2000 members. I'm also the founder of Fruz and Law. And I have spent quite a bit of time talking to the legal community about the paraprofessional program as a whole. I would generally second Ken Wang's points and those that came before me as well. Sincerely, I do appreciate that you guys are trying to close a justice gap that that shouldn't be lost on anyone you're doing the right thing and there's certainly needs in that particular direction and I appreciate your concerns, however, ultimately I wonder if the way that we're going about this is ultimately going to accomplish the goals you're looking for. Uh, as it is now, lawyers are heavily regulated, as we should be. And even under such scrutiny, there's been issues with lawyers. We all know this. So there's no way of denying that at this point. And it somehow feels like what we might be doing by creating the paraprofessional program is opening the door on even more questionable practices while simultaneously leaving other options behind on the table, such as Betsetic and other programs out there. There are wonderful legal aid organizations. There are wonderful nonprofit organizations out there. I swear five minutes ago, we were all saying, why don't we get these guys more funding? And yet here we are instead trying to allow private companies to get involved in these things, allowing the private sector to profiteer. Guys, I appreciate what you're doing. I'm gonna yield the rest of my time at the end of the day. Sincerely, I hope we can all figure this out. Thank you, Mr. Feruza. Next, we have Myung Lee. Give me one second. Myung, uh, your mic has been enabled and you have three minutes. Good morning, thank you so much. My name is Minyoung Lee and I am a senior attorney with Neighborhood Legal Services of Los Angeles County, which is a legal aid organization providing free legal services to low income communities throughout LA County. I would like to provide public comment on matter 701 on the agenda concerning the paraprofessional program and start off by commending and thanking the working group who have expended so much time and energy into this. 
But as a legal services organization, there are many things about the current proposed program that concern us for the communities that we serve. So in addition to the written public comments already submitted, I want to share a story um, of a client as a way to highlight why we continue to be opposed to the program in its current form. NLSLA had a client who had just lost her unlawful detainer trial regarding her 40-year tenancy at a rent-stabilized property. She then hired a paralegal who asserted that the state bar allowed him to handle evictions as a paraprofessional. He promised the client that he would prepare an ex parte motion for a new trial based on newly found evidence and charged the client $2,500 to do this work. This paralegal gave ex parte notice, but then proceeded to negotiate with opposing counsel on the client's behalf without her knowledge or her consent. The paralegal then had the client come to his office to appear remotely for an ex parte hearing, which is when she first learned that he agreed to a settlement that allowed her to have 30 extra days for an additional one month of rent. She never agreed to this, was never even informed of the settlement until she appeared for her hearing in his office. The paralegal advised the client that he regularly deals with attorneys and that this was the best outcome for her. The record was not sealed and she will continue to have an eviction appear on her credit report. These are the kind of stories that our clients come to us with. And we believe that the current proposed paraprofessional program will lead to more clients who will experience these types of bad acts, which is why we continue to be opposed to the paraprofessional program as it's currently being proposed. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ms. Lee. Uh, I suspect it goes without saying, but I'll say it anyway, that I hope that you or someone at your organization has uh, reported the paralegal to the state bar and other appropriate authorities for follow-up. Um, and uh, we'll move on to the next speaker. Thank you. Next, we have Mike Balot. Your mic has been enabled and you have three minutes. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair and members. Mike Belote speaking on behalf of the California Defense Council. I'll be very brief. You've heard a, 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 a steady, consistent message, I think. We would align ourselves as an organization with Mr. Fleissman, uh, Ms. Cerna, Ms. Farron, and others. Uh, you have had good people, thoughtful people working hard on this, regardless of their perspective. But this is a big issue, uh, and, I, and I think it's unfortunate if it gets painted as lawyers versus the public. I think uh, the, the scholarship behind the degree of the problem, the nature of the problem, uh, you know, is, is flawed, frankly. And I think it has led to a conclusion uh, which is not supported by the underlying facts. Uh, additionally, when you start creating new license categories, uh, that's a complicated process for the legislature. Uh, and I'm not sure that, uh, that uh, the issues have been sufficiently fleshed out as to cost, uh, scope, and that sort of thing. We just believe the report, although well-intentioned, is not ready to go, is not ready to go to the Supreme Court or the legislature. Uh, and you ought to, in, in my view, uh, take special heed of the comments by legal aid organizations, because I'm not at all sure that all options have been considered in terms of delivering expanded services through the good legal organ aid organizations that exist already. So we would be opposed to forwarding the report for implementation by the Supreme Court or uh, the legislature. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Below. Next, we have Jason Solomon. Jason, your mic has been enabled and you have three minutes. Hi, my name is Jason Solomon. I'm with the Stanford Center on the Legal Profession. We've observed this process from the beginning and have commented throughout. And I just wanna say in opposition to mostly, uh, to most of what's been said today on this paraprofessional's proposal, this is a very strong and sound proposal. It's very thoughtful. It's modest, it starts as a pilot in certain counties and in certain practice areas. It requires appropriate levels of training and education for these new paraprofessionals. It's a strong, it's sound, it's well thought through, it's incremental. Uh, the working group responded to the public comments by making revisions in response, and this is ready to go, it's ready to go forward. Uh, secondly, we have a huge access to justice problem. And the answer 
some people, some commenters have said, well, we shouldn't try this. We should, we should think about other things. Everything has been thought of. Everything has been tried. We need to try this and we need to try seven other things as well. The scope of the problem is that large and the things we've tried over the past few decades haven't worked well or haven't worked well enough. So absolutely, we need to try this and we need to start now. Not only that, but the practice of people who are not lawyers representing people in certain cases is actually fairly well established both here in California, in federal administrative agencies, in other states such as Washington and abroad in places like Ontario and the UK. Um, I wanna point out that on the paraprofessional working group, you've heard from a few of the dissenters on that group. I wanna point out that the only dissenters from the paraprofessional working group were people like Mr. Fleischman and Ms. Shining who were appointed by interest groups. Uh, when Mr. Fleischman spoke earlier, he didn't mention that he was the representative of either the California Lawyers Association or California Association of Defense Counsel, I'm not sure which. Ms. Shining is the representative of the consumer attorneys. So yes, there are lawyer interest groups who are worried about competition and they are opposed to this. But there are people like teachers and nurses and grocery store workers who have to go into court every day facing life, facing serious life issues like custody or divorce with no help at all. And the question is, if you can't pay $200 or $300 an hour, do you have to really go it on your own or can you get some kind of more affordable help? And the answer should be yes you should be able to get some kind of affordable help, even if you're not wealthy. This is a very well thought proposal. It needs to go forward. And I encourage you to move it forward right away. Thanks so much. Thank you, Mr. Solomon. Madam Secretary, it looks like we have no other members of the public uh, requesting to speak. Make a last call here, if you're on the phone or on video. And seeing none, we'll move right into item 701. Um, Chair Duran, yes. I apologize. I'd like to just note for the record that Trustee De La Cruz is here now. Great, thank you. I will also actually uh, make a final request of the trustees just to make sure that there are no members of the public there present with you in person who um, may want to address the board. Looks like you're all alone, but you just never know. Okay, great. Uh, if we could... Uh, elevate Justice Petru as a panelist. Um, and while the Secretary is doing that, I will introduce item 701. We just heard uh, plenty of public comment about that. Uh, we have a presentation from Justice Iona Petru of the First District Court of Appeal, who served as the chair of the working group, um, whose, um, whose work we, we have uh, in the staff report and certainly about which we've heard a lot today and, and in the recent past. So. Without further ado, Justice Petru, good morning and welcome. Good morning, Ruben. And just a correction, I don't expect you to get it right. But my first name is pronounced Joanna for further Yo reference. <laughs> it's tricky, the I's a Y sound. Thank um, you. No, no worries at all. So I actually believe that Leah was going to kick us off here. I believe that she has a PowerPoint presentation that she would like to use as part of this. And I'm gonna allow her to go ahead and make her preliminary, not allow, but this is how we decided to do it, that she would go ahead and make her preliminary comments and then I will make comments. And obviously um, anytime anyone wants to jump in and ask questions, I don't want anyone to think that they have to wait until the end here. I, I certainly envision this as a con, you know, informational presentation, uh, understanding that you all have received the updated information, including the dissents. I think you also received, if I'm correct, the updated uh, justice gap study, uh, bringing up to speed what the data is regarding how just how severe the access to justice is in civil matters in the state of California, very, very unfortunately. Um, but with all that, I'm always happy to have a conversation. And so please chime in. And Leah, am I correct that we have a PowerPoint? We do. I was hoping to start off before Louisa puts it up. You have it, Louisa, correct? Before you put it up, I just wanted to kind of step back and frame um, the conversation for the board a, a, a bit, if you would indulge me. Um, so I'm going to just remind us of why this initiative was launched in the first place, uh, quoting from the board's action when it established the working group. Uh, the state bar's then recently published justice gap study found that 55% of Californians, regardless of income, 
experience at least one civil legal problem in their household each year. And that Californians, again, regardless of income, received no or inadequate legal help for 85% of those problems. A lack of knowledge about what constitutes a legal issue and concerns about costs lead many Californians to deal with problems on their own rather than seek legal help. A thoughtfully designed and appropriately regulated paraprofessionals program is an important component of the solution to the access to legal services crisis in California. So that was what motivated the board to establish the working group in the first place. Then, as Justice Petru alluded to, most recently, the Federal Legal Services Corporation has published an updated justice gap study. This is a national report, but its findings are quite startling. So whereas I quoted the 85% of problems uh, go unmet, here in the 2022 report, it's 92% of civil legal problems. Uh, folks are receiving no or inadequate legal help. And for people over the 400% of the federal poverty level, this is income in excess of $100,000 a year, that percentage is 78% unmet legal needs. And based on income specifically, based on cost, between 27 and 55% of the reason that folks cite in that federal study that they are not able to access legal help is cost. So the affordability of legal services is a pervasive problem. It's a problem in our state, it's a problem throughout our country, and it is a problem that impacts not only the very low income, but also moderate income, middle income people in our state and across the country. We will be updating our own justice gap study, our California specific study in 2024. However, I do want to point out to the board that this board and this bar has been studying and issuing reports on the justice gap for at least 40 years, 40 years of study. Is it time to take action? That is the question for you. In establishing the working group, you did so. And that was, I think, a change because the working group was not asked to study whether or not there should be a paraprofessional program. The working group was asked to design a paraprofessional program. And perhaps the ability of the board to take that decisive action, that rather decisive action in light of a 40-year history of studying and issuing reports was in part due to the transition of the state bar in 2018 into a purely regulatory bar. We are here to serve the public. And so I just want to uh, start out my remarks uh, with that bit of background and context. And now we can put up the PowerPoint slide. So you could advance, Louisa, to the first slide. I'm only gonna do the first couple of slides and the last one, this, yeah. yeah. I'm sorry, can you, uh, are you able to see it in slideshow? No. Okay, give me one moment. Okay. How about now? Yes, you could advance it. Okay. Um, sorry, I have multiple monitors. Okay, there we go. All right. So just in terms of an overview of the public comment received, there was extensive public comment. I did not do a quantitative um, analysis of this, but I believe this is the most public comment we have received on a proposal, certainly in my two different stints here at the bar. Over 2,000 comments received by nearly 1,300 commenters. And that comment, because it was quite extensive, we for the first time used a really modern platform to categorize and organize the public comment in a Power BI platform. Um, and I hope that all of you have had the chance to play around uh, there um, because it does make um, it fairly easy to read a, a rather extensive uh, set of comments. Of the comments received from individuals, 71% uh, of individual commenters were categorized as attorneys, 
23% as non-attorneys. And this is really important. We've been talking as a board uh, in many different venues or, or in relation to many different things about the need to bring in the public voice and the consumer voice. With respect to this effort, there were multiple efforts to try to get public comment from true members of the public, consumers of legal services or potential consumers of legal services. To some extent, you can say we didn't do that well. Less than one quarter of these comments received are from non-attorneys. But in comparison to other public comment efforts where we have captured this information, this is quite a significant increase in the voice of non-attorneys. Attorneys were opposed to the recommendations issued for public comment at a rate of 90%, 90% opposition, while non-attorneys supported the recommendations by 75%. And then you can see there was a category of folks we were unable to classify. You can go forward, Louisa. All right. With respect to organizations, comments were submitted on behalf of 106 organizations, 74% of which indicated opposition to the recommendations. Uh, the bulk of that opposition coming from law firms, attorney membership organizations, and legal services programs. Um, in contrast, we point out academic institutions, consumer advocacy organizations indicated support for the recommendations. The working group met twice to consider the public comment received at March 4th and April 20th. You can advance the slide. We're going to go into the changes that they made pursuant to that review of public comment now. And I am going to turn this over to Justice Petru to walk you through those changes. All right. Thank you, Leah. And of course, I mean, none of this is news to you because you have all the information, but we wanted to kind of summarize it um, on a high level for purposes of review today. So, you know, as Leah indicated, we received a great number of public comments, which I think were, was a great thing to receive a lot of comments, both from attorneys in various kinds of areas and from a number of members of the public as well. It was very helpful. It really helped us focus. But the first thing we had to do at that juncture was figure out, okay, how are we going to actually go through these? And I just want to take a moment to thank um, Leah and thank Bar staff for doing what I think was an extraordinary job of putting together the comments and doing so in an interactive way such that I went in many times and tried to sort through things and was able to sort through things and get to individual comments and in individual areas. I couldn't have done it if I had just had over 2000 comments dumped in my lap. And so I really do need to take a moment to appreciate the tremendous amount of excellent and hard work that went into that. That being said, um, and of course, everyone on the working group had access to that information. One of the first things, the first thing we had to do was figure out how to prioritize our review of the then pro proposed program in light of the comments. And of course, what we did not surprisingly is decide that we had to consider any new information, any arguments not previously considered, um, and also focus on things that seem to get a good amount of attention, such as the ownership provisions, the fee sharing provisions, and we've decided to include as well the disclosure provisions. And then members of the working group during the meetings, you know, they had the opportunities, of course, to uh, make motions and raise issues, which did occur. And, and again, you have the detailed information on that. So after review and consideration of the comments in these various categories, we uh, had the opportunity for the first and second meeting. And the and when I say we, it's the working group. I didn't vote on anything. Um, so the working group decided to amend its original recommendations as outlined in the next few slides that I'm going to be presenting. So first of all, here, with respect to the collateral criminal practice areas, and this is in the licensing uh, section here on the left side of your slide, the working and just to be clear, and as a reminder, collateral criminal includes things like expungements and reclassification of convictions. And the working group voted to require the prospective licensees to receive spe specific training on the potential immigration consequences for non-citizen clients. Why did the working group do this? Um, because there were comments received which really got our attention and was an excellent reminder, again, the importance of public comment, 
regarding the potential risks to non-citizen clients in this practice area. And there was a discussion that, of course, uh, we want to be able to provide assistance to non-citizens who have to deal with these legal issues, but want to do so in, in the best possible way. And so in order to, for the paraprofessionals to provide this assistance to the non-citizens for things like expungements and reclassifications, we felt it was very important to include training as to the potential uh, collateral consequences to for the immigration consequences. So that is why that modification was made. And then um, more broadly on the educational front, which is in the so it's kind of second box from your left in there under licensing. The working group received comments about best practices on individual, excuse me, in educational design. Things like rather than focusing so much on credit hours, focus on outcomes. We did not have the opportunity to consider a wholesale change to the educational requirements. Um, I continue to think there's some value in credit hours. For example, when you look at the way that law school classes are set up, uh, credit hours are certainly part of it. So I doubt, I personally doubt you're going to completely toss the credit hours idea. I think it's great to look at these um, additional outcomes. But the point here was really to add recommendations, signaling an intention that the final education requirements be informed by best practices in licensing. The working group is not comprised of a group of people who can set up the educational requirements. The point behind it is to really set up the general framework of what kinds of training should be required for each area of specification or specialization. Because again, this program doesn't contemplate that one would get licensed as a paraprofessional and be able to go out and do everything under that program. One would be licensed, for example, as a paraprofessional in family or in collateral criminal you know, or in UD and within those that certain educational requirements be met. And then it's really for the people who are the experts in the area to sit down and figure out exactly, exactly what that looks like for a program. So um, we as a working group would want there to be sufficient flexibility to of course ensure meaningful public protection while aligning with the best practices. Okay, next one. Um, third from the left, second, no, no, I'm sorry, I'm still on that last slide. I mean, next little box here, which I'm unhelpfully circling on my own screen, which you can't see, so I don't know why I'm doing that. But with respect to family, children, and custody, there were a couple of clarifications. Um, one was to explicitly exclude conservatorship and guardianship of estate matters, which is what we intended from the get-go, so I'm not quite sure why it wasn't in there, but it's in there now. And the second was to expressly exclude surrogate parentage actions. Um, this was raised as part of the comment process, a very good point that was raised. Surrogate parentage is a very, very complicated area and also does not tend to be the area where we see anywhere near or significant of a justice gap. So between the uh, complexity of the area combined with nowhere near the kind of need that we're talking about otherwise, we decided, we, again, being the working group, I decide nothing, to uh, exclude the surrogate parentage cases. Okay, um, now, Louisa, the next slide, please. All right, um, in regards to oversight and regulation, we had a lot of conversation on the first round and had more conversation on this round regarding who should be on the oversight committee. There was a recommendation that was embraced by the working group as a whole that they should include an attorney with experience serving low to moderate income Californians. Um, I don't think I need to say really much more about that. I think it's self-evident why that would be useful. And then also that there was already a, as part of the proposal, that there be an ongoing legal education requirement regarding bias and we could accept in that bucket of bias um, that also disability related bias would be in there. Okay, next slide, please. Um, no surprise to you, as you all know, the biggest bucket, uh, you know, for lack of a better term, 
that received the most comments had to do with paraprofessional ownership of law firms. Um, I think actually when I last met with you many moons ago at this point, there was we had a little bit of conversation or I made some comment about how you know, we, we anticipated that we were going to get a lot of comments about this. So this was not a surprise. Um, bottom line, it's been eliminated such that paraprofessionals cannot um, own a law firm with attorneys. And if, you know, I'm, I'm sure that Leo would be glad to have further discussion with you all uh, if and when you'd like to do that today. But in event, any event, that which from my reading, I think was the most controversial um, aspect of the initial proposal did generate a lot of comment and was ultimately removed after further conversation and another vote by the working group. Another topic that got a good amount of discussion in our meetings um, was the disclosure. We spent a great amount of time on this in the first go round and spent some more time on this go round and in the area of disclosure, which I, I really want to emphasize these proposals also um, would put requirements on the state bar itself. One would be that the state bar would generate and make available a standardized initial disclosure form that would address the following. It's on here, the scope of license. Uh, and again, what's on here is really not that different from what was there before, but it would be the state bar has to have a sample form, scope of license, the fact that the client may need to hire a lawyer, the fact that there are other alternative choices available for the client to consider or potentially free legal services, the paraprofessional's general fee structure and billing methods, and whether or not there's professional liability insurance. And what is different, uh, so again, these topics within it are not really substantially different from my recollection from what was there before, other than the state bar would have a sample disclosure form. What would be different, and I think it might be on the next slide. Let me take a look. It is. Yeah, it's on the next slide. Louisa, can we go to the next one? Okay. Before um, the idea was to have the paraprofessionals, you know, certainly inform prospective clients that there may be other low cost or free legal services available. Um, now the idea was to have that be more explicit, but then we had a discussion about how does one go about doing that? You know, we heard from numerous people, including one of our working group members who works in the self-help center at her county's court about how it's actually very difficult to maintain an ongoing list of what these alternative providers are with current contact information. Um, and the working group as a whole felt like that was uh, certainly an undue, in, in some ways unrealistic burden to place upon the individual paraprofessionals. I mean, I'll note that this is not a burden that we place on any attorneys. Um, but, you know, maybe you should, but that, that's a topic for another day. But as part of this, the working group has a recommendation that the state bar develop a non-exhaustive referral list of free legal service providers and modest mean panels available by county and practice area, such that when the paraprofessional is providing the information, the paraprofessional can piggyback off that resource in order to do so, and that there would be that centralized resource. So that's kind of the bulk of the um, recommendations in that area. And before we move to program funding, you know, I will say uh, I was extremely impressed and, and grateful for the time that COPRAC, uh, the State Bar's Committee on Professional Responsibility, and also the Los Angeles County Bar Association, they both took a tremendous amount of time to go through the rules like in great detail and to comment very specifically on the rules throughout. Uh, a lot of what they had to say was very much encompassed and considered as part of the recommended changes that I just went through. There were other things that were recommended in there that I did not just go through because they were voted on and, and, and not accepted by the group. That being said, there are some additional details and information in their lengthy proposals or lengthy comments, I should say. And we wanted to make it very clear that we think that as this program goes forward, that the state bar should, of course, go back and go through those comments again as part of the process. And I'm going to leave it to Leah when she sees fit to talk about, I think, at the end, the process going forward. 
as part of the process to issue the final set of rules and accompanying comments um, for public comment. Okay, if we could please go to the next slide regarding funding. So, well, I believe it was Stephen Fleischman who during the public comment period today made a mention about uh, technology companies. That was a motion that was brought before the working group um, that didn't go forward in that, in that way, but we'll talk in a second about how it did go forward. I just want to share that part of the working group discussion about the technology companies and, and why the working group didn't just want to do a blanket no to technology companies is that that's a very um, complicated issue, right? There's some technology companies, first of all, how do you define that? But secondly, there's some technology companies that have um, nonprofit or public benefit arms that are kept separate, at least to some degree. And the concern from the working group was, how are we going to do this? Like, if we can't just list companies, if we list it by sector, how is that actually going to work? Is that going to preclude the ability to potentially get funding that wouldn't be tied to some other interest or overseen by some other interest? And so the more the discussion happened, the more that it really came down to a transparency issue, that the working group felt um, that there should be no funding for the implementation or maintenance of the program without people knowing where the money came from. And uh, so it, it's really a commitment to transparency that the working group wanted to emphasize here rather than saying ahead of time what would be appropriate or not, make it clear where the money comes from such that everyone knows and that there can be a weighing and a discussion and a feedback loop that happens. Also, there was a very, in regards to funding, a very strong interest on behalf of the working group in not diverting any funds that would otherwise support the state bar's disciplinary system. I mean, I don't need to tell you what's going on in that whole area and uh, the great public interest in that being adequately supported and funded. Uh, and we did not want to pull money from there for any reason. Therefore, the two recommended modifications have to do with transparent modifications regarding funding have to do one with transparency and two with the funding not coming from funds that would otherwise be used to support the state bars discipline system. Okay, next slide, please. And then the program evaluation. Um, you know, I think that not I think I know here the issue is not wanting there to be moving metrics that maybe make the program look worse or better than it would otherwise right if any of you have ever been involved with um clinical trials or you know other kinds of scientific trials you know you set your criteria at the front end you design your program and you set your criteria at the front end and then you measure it against that criteria in order to be able to determine the success or failure of your hypothesis or program or whatever it is that you're doing. And for kind of structural integrity and the integrity of the evaluation, the working group wanted the evaluation metrics to be developed and finalized by an independent evaluator in advance of implementation such that we can have faith, that you can have faith and that the public can have faith that the evaluation that happens, which would of course be on an ongoing basis, um, as was mentioned, the idea here is to roll this out as a pilot program, can be data that we actually have faith and trust in. So I think that's it for me, but I know Leah, you wanted to talk about uh, moving forward. Yes. Can you advance the slide please, Louisa? All right, so in terms of next steps and really what you're being asked to do today, what you're being asked to do today is simply to accept the revised recommendations of the working group and to incorporate those revisions into the program design. So you got the initial program design in September from the working group. So these uh, revisions would be incorporated into that document and an attachment A of the agenda item that comes from staff as opposed to from the working group reflects what incorporation of those revisions would be. So it's really accepted. You're not being asked today to advance a proposal onto the next step, okay? But let's just talk about what those next steps would be. The next step is to submit a formal proposal for a paraprofessional program to the Supreme Court. That proposal would be approved by the board prior to being submitted to the court. 
And so that would happen either at your July meeting or at your September meeting. And I am currently in some conversation with my Supreme Court counterpart about timing and how this might work. And that's why there's a little bit of an ambiguity here. But even more substantively is the question of what exactly would be proposed. You heard some uh, comments alluding to that, certainly in the written comment, you received some concerns about what exactly would be submitted to the Supreme Court. I want to give an example of a couple of issues uh, that I think the board will need to contend with. So as a staff team, we reviewed all of that public comment and came forward to the uh, paraprofessional working group's first meeting with several recommendations, staff recommendations. One of those was to eliminate the ownership provision, and you see that reflected in the, in the action of the working group. But there were a couple of others. One had to do with uh, fee caps and whether or not there should be fee caps for paraprofessionals. Another had to do with in-court representation. These are some of the most uh, controversial provisions of the proposal. So one of the questions for, for the board will be, in advancing a, a program or pro program proposal to the Supreme Court, do you want to reconsider those issues? The working group declined to do so, even though there was a lot of a debate uh, and uh, I think contention on the working group about those topics. Ultimately, they did not revise their recommendations in, the, in that area. So when you hear a concern or, or a comment expressed about what kind of changes might be made to the program, I'm giving you two examples of issues that I think are very important policy ones that the board may decide you want to weigh in on and alter the, mod the recommendations of the working group before you advance a proposal to the court. So the time frame again, for that is July or September. One of the things that is unclear, uh, certainly in, in this proposal that you see up here on the screen or this uh, timeline, is whether or not the program proposed to the court would be formally put out by the board for public comment before it is submitted to the court. And I think you can hear from the public comment uh, that that would be the request uh, from those that are weighing in on public comment. Uh, so that's a decision you all will have to make. Uh, but I do know that sort of task number one is figuring out what the program parameters should be. Then if the Supreme Court does decide to authorize the program, the next step is to submit it to the legislature for approval. So we've been pretty consistent in messaging that uh, time, the, the, those steps. But I wanted to lay it out here that we're talking about having a, a proposed program back to you for either your July meeting or your September meeting. You will have to make a decision as to whether or not you put that out for public comment at that time, receive the public comment, make any further modifications, and then the next step is to submit it to the, to the Supreme Court. So the only last slide is the resolution, I wonder, uh, uh, Chair Duran, would you like us to take it down just for conversation before putting up the resolution? Yes, please. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay. Justice Petru, uh, Leah, thank you very much both for the, the con concise yet comprehensive uh, report. Um, let me open it up to the board. Are there any questions of either Justice Petru or Ms. Wilson? Mr. Tony, please. Thank you, Chair Duran. Um, this is an informational question. Um, one of the earlier memos in describing this proposal as a pilot listed a number of specific geographic regions, counties, what have you, where it was being suggested. Is that something that will be determined later in more implementation, or is what we are considering also the location of the pilot? Don't mean to take that. Okay, so uh, there were public comments received uh, regarding the rollout of the, the phased implementation. I think we are trying to refer to it as rather than a pilot, uh, okay. but the working group did not make any uh, proposed uh, changes to 
the counties that were originally identified in their September report. Uh, there were some proposals to amend or modify the list. So what we have today is that original set of counties, jurisdictions that you're referring to, that those remain the, the, the counties that are identified for initial rollout. And so uh, Mark, as part of um, uh, finalizing the proposal to go to the Supreme Court at this juncture, just speaking uh, off the cuff right now, I would not anticipate that I would be recommending changes because those were selected sort of a, um, based on certain metrics. And I don't think those metrics are gonna change uh, very much in this intervening period. So it's not an area where I would uh, think there would be changes uh, at this juncture in the process. As it goes forward to the Supreme Court and then to the legislature, there may very well be changes in that in the complete approach to the initial uh, rollout, but I certainly haven't thought about any at this time. If, if I could make one quick suggestion, not mm -hmm. as something that is a um, issue, but the one thing I see missing when I had looked at those, and we really haven't talked about this issue before, um, I, I would suggest a consideration of Humboldt County and the reason is because that is where you have one of the largest concentrations of uh, Indian Native American populations in the state of California. And in terms of being inclusive of uh, Native populations, I, 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 I did not see anywhere else on the list that had those concentrations. So um, it, it's not an issue uh, for this. But um, I just wanted that to be under consideration in the future. Um, I, um, I've got one, um, I really appreciate all of the revisions being made. Um, and they've addressed almost all of my concerns. But there is one that remains to me, and it's the funding source issue. And I, I, I have to say, and this is a principle that goes beyond whether it's a company or a not a company or a technology or a conflict of interest. I understand those concerns that have been brought up, but it has to do with the responsibility of the legislature. I have always fought against the, the principle of unfunded mandates. I do not believe it is proper for the legislature to adopt new programs create mandates without being willing to fund them, okay? And that's a principle that goes even beyond the state bar. And it, it, I think it's a general principle. You want a program, you fund the program. So I would very much like to see clarity on the, 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 the fact that the legislature, at least for the startup funds, uh, uh, that the expectation is that they will fund it. And if they don't care enough about to fund it, if they're not, if they're not making a funding commitment, they shouldn't be uh, approving it. So I, I just wanna make myself very clear. That is the single change that I would like to see everything else I can live with. Thank you, Trustee Tony. Uh, Justice Petrie, do, do you wanna uh, supplement anything there? Nope. Okay. Any other questions or comments from the board? Uh, I will step in with one. Um, I, I think it's wise um, to use the concept of metrics in advance of the program implementation. And uh, I'm intrigued by the concept of an independent evaluator. I didn't see any discussion in the written materials about um, who or what that, that uh, evaluator might be. Um, and I was wondering whether there's any conversation um, at the working group about, are we talking about a, a retired justice? Are we talking about a practicing lawyer? Any thought on uh, who would fill that role potentially? Um, I'll, I'll let Leah, I just, just to say that there was not really conversation um, amongst us as a group, uh, other than the fact that it be someone independent. Um, I, I, there, I think there's certainly experts in this field countrywide that you all may want to look at and it may not be may not be one person you know it may be that you want to have someone um, very familiar with the California legal system it may be that you want to have someone 
who's uh, an expert on, an academic who's an expert on the implementation of these programs nationwide. I mean, I can off the top of my head think of more than one, but I think what the working group was trying to get across was, as you noted, you know, the metrics being set early on and then coupling that with the independent evaluator again, so that we really have uh, a good solid report back to you and to the public about the usefulness and certainly the working group hopes that it's a very positive impact, but we want to know what it is. Leah? Yes, I would just add, um, certainly it would, I don't think Ruben, it would be an individual. We're talking about something like a RAND, uh, University of Chicago type of uh, evaluation institution entity. Um, that being said, I think they will have to augment sort of the quantitative um, evaluation component with subject matter experts, which would be attorneys, um, but also consumers of services, uh, because those are some of the um, metrics that have been identified as well and uh, consumers or observers of services that being in the court side so there's a lot of different um, metrics that have already been identified and I think the evaluation firm will need to make sure that they have not only the quantitative under chops to do um, a real analysis of impact and outcomes but also the subject matter expertise that is required. Great that makes sense to me thank you. Trustees, any questions? Uh, hi, Lynn, please, Ms. Chen. So thank you for that thoughtful presentation, Justice Petru. I have a question about how the working group envisions the oversight committee um, working together or separate from the regulation and discipline committee. Um, you know, as you know, the regulation and discipline committee of the state bar oversees the work of the Office of Chief Trial Counsel and the regulation, the discipline function of the state bar. And so if these paraprofessionals are also subject to a similar discipline function, how, you know, was there any discussion about how the oversight committee would be working together with, with RAD or apart from RAD, you know, has there been has there been any thought given to I think, reporting? Yeah, so Lee, I'm going to let you take this one. I will just say I do believe that the initial uh, proposal had a good amount of detail in that, but Leah? Yeah, this is not, it's, uh, this is intended to be a separate committee appointed by the board and reporting to the board. Um, uh, I, I would consider it more like a, a CBE in its structure than a RAD, and we did not have um, in-depth in discussions at all about how it might relate to a RAD, because this is designed to be kind of its own ecosystem, a very different discipline system, because these cases uh, would not go through state bar court, mm -hmm. um, but have a hearing, more of the uh, DCA board hearing panel model. So, um, so that there's probably work to do, Highland, to art better articulate the relationship to RAD, uh, but it is uh, designed to be pretty an independent uh, sub-entity of the bar. Okay. Thank you. Trustee Selig. Thank you. Bear with me. I'm having some technical issues. I have a question that really is really a drafting question. And so if you want to do policy discussion first and save this, I can defer. Whatever you prefer, Ruben. I saw Trustee Broughton's hand go up and then go down. Um, I, I would prefer that if it's a drafting issue, let's wait until we get the resolution up on the screen. And if Mark, if you're not, uh, if if you no longer wish to speak, then we can we can put it up on the screen. Did you want to? Well, it, it was it was just a, a comment to what um, was just said, and that is that ultimately the board has oversight over this um, this organization. And, and I have to tell you that I'm, I'm not wholeheartedly yet uh, in favor of this proposal. I do need to see some additional uh, information on where it goes. I, I certainly, though, would like to see it go to the Supreme Court and see what the Supreme Court has to say about it. Um, but I have those issues with regard to funding and so forth. I, I, I struggle with whether we should be putting whatever the amount of money and resources into this program versus putting it into the discipline system, which is our ultimate goal. That's something that I 
in the last few months really been struggling with. Um, <clears throat> so I, I, ultimately the board has to, has to have oversight over this, whether it's a separate committee or not. And then I, I, I wonder about um, all the other subcommittees that we've had and some of the challenges that we've had and the additional uh, responsibilities that will be placed on the board to, uh, on that oversight. Uh, I just wanted to throw that in while um, Highland had made that comment. Thank you, Trustee Broughton. I, I, I will, uh, if I could, just um, reiterate or amplify what Justice Petri mentioned about uh, the, the recommendation that, that, that there be no funds re, uh, redistributed or you know, that, that the disciplinary system funding not be affected by uh, the funding needs for this, this program. And, and I understood that to mean it would not affect um, our current you know, Office of Chief Trial Counsel and the resources that they get. Right, that's the, um, that, that's the recommendation, that's the intention. And I, I think that, not I think, the program ultimately must be self-sustaining or you will see the result that you saw in Washington that's been alluded to several times. Um, and it's self-sustaining through licensing fees, just the way the attorney regulation system, to the extent it is self-sustaining, it is done through licensing fees. So the question here is really the initial startup costs and how will they be funded? Um, so we're pretty, pretty clear. The working group's recommendation is no funding for that purpose that could be used to support the discipline system. And that could be the board's directive as well, easily. Thank you for pointing out this, that distinction, Leah. Trustee Sowell. I just have a quick sort of refresher type question. And I appreciate the, uh, the, the presentation. And, and once again, all the work that has gone, uh, gone into this. Um, I'm still, maybe I just have, have forgotten, the, uh, the pipeline of individuals that potentially can be recruited and trained to do this, to do this. How, what is the process uh, that's gonna occur relative to that? Well, the pipeline of um, eligible uh, potential licensees is limited because the working group has recommended that only those with a JD, an LLM, or who are certified paralegals or LDAs, legal document assistants, um, would be eligible in the first instance to pursue a license. So you're not talking about just anybody. Um, so in, if, if you mean what will be the strategy for outreach, um, if that's what you're referring to, well, that, that's a, gonna be a multifaceted effort um, that it, it will include working through um, law schools to look at their graduates and certainly the, their graduates that they know have not passed the bar exam, the population of folks that we know have taken the bar exam multiple times and, and not passed. And in fact, we use that data to help inform the selection of the counties for the initial rollout. There are paralegal associations in this state. There are also uh, ABA certified paralegal training programs many of which are in our California community colleges. And we have already started throughout this process to build relationship with the uh, community colleges board. That would be an important avenue for outreach. And then there is the legal document assistance is perhaps the hardest group to contact. There is a statewide association, uh, but there's a belief that there are many, many, many more LDAs out there uh, than are members of the statewide association. So it's a targeted uh, outreach strategy to the different eligible uh, li potential licensee populations. And Leah, just a point of clarification on that, that limited uh, group of potential participants, is that for the, the initial phases only or for the long-term viability of the, uh, the program? I think that's a question. That is the design that has been put forward by the working group. And I think that's part of balancing um, the goal of increasing access with a, a public protection concern. Um, and so uh, the, the requirements for entry uh, in this California program, as far as I can tell, are more restrictive than any of the other 20 plus states that are currently in some process of developing a paraprofessional program. Um, and it may be that we find that 
they are too restrictive and limit the number of uh, prospective licensees, but we'll only know that if we allow this to get started. Right, exactly what I was thinking. Trustees, any further comments or questions before we put the resolution up and Sean can um, put his drafting issue on the table? Okay, seeing none, Louisa, if you would, please. Thank you. I'm going to read the resolution, just uh, I know we have some folks on the phone. So the following resolution is proposed to the State Bar Board of Trustees. Resolve that the board accepts the CPPWG proposed amendments and clarifications to the program recommendations and rules of professional conduct for licensed paraprofessionals provided to the board in the September 23rd, 2001 California Paraprofessional Working Group Report and directs that these amendments and clarifications be incorporated into the final program design. Is there a note for the resolution or is that it? That's it. Okay, Sean, the floor is yours. All right, thank you. Luisa, could you put up the document I sent you on the screen, please? And while you're doing that, I, first I have a question, which is, um, uh, I found, well, I found part of the proposed changes to Rule 5.4 um, confusing, and I may be confused about one issue, so I'll raise that in a second. But it, looking at this raised the question in my mind whether, and maybe this is in parts of the proposal that aren't in front of us because they haven't been amended, but is there a provision for uh, two things? One, permission for paraprofessionals to practice in the form of a firm and share fees within the confines of a firm, as I understand it, made up only of paraprofessionals, not including any lawyers? And is there a provision similar to Rule 1.5.1 that allows lawyers who are not in the same firm to share fees with client consent? Well, I know that the answer to the first question is yes. On 1.5.1, I'm hoping that we have a uh, Randy, who I don't see, I'm going to have to uh, get back get back to you hopefully during this meeting on that one, Sean. Okay. Because it was a lot All of right. back and forth on 1.5.1. .1. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, so, all right. So now turning to this, the document on the screen. So the D, uh, so um, this is the proposed rule that we're asked to recommend today. So I took out all the redlining. If you want to look at your materials, at the, if this is at page seven of the memo. Um, so these are changes to the proposed changes. The D1 I found to be really confusing. And if, I'm under, if I read it without understanding the background, I don't think I would really directly understand what, what is intended. But it seems to me the intention of this is to say that a licensed paraprofessional can only practice in a firm in which no one other than another licensed paraprofessional owns an interest. So that excludes lawyers and it excludes non-lawyers who are not licensed paraprofessionals. Is that the intention of D1 or am I getting that wrong? Um, I'm, I'm sorry, Sean, I was reaching out to to somebody in your one so, so, question. Yeah, the question that the question that Sean posed was whether this is meant to exclude a paraprofessional from sharing ownership interest with anyone who's not a paraprofessional, not just lawyers, which I don't know that that was something and you can help clarify my recollection. I don't think we discussed it in the working group in the context of a paraprofessional and anyone else. We were discussing paraprofessionals and lawyers. Um, that, but that's that's just off the top of my head. That's correct. That's what we discussed. I, who, like who else, Sean, would a paraprofessional own a firm with? Well, the way this is, let me see. Hold on a second. Let me look at the original again. Yes. So as I read D1, as it's proposed to us, it doesn't preclude paraprofessional practicing in a firm 
in which a non-lawyer owns an interest. That's one issue. The other is just that it's very confusing. So I, I thought if I, the I thought the intention is to say um, a licensed paraprofessional can't own an interest in a law firm. In other words, right? Right. Right. What so I, I think that means they can only form a partnership or a firm with other licensed paraprofessionals. Yes. What I'm going to say, um, Sean, is that this issue was uh, exhaustively addressed by um, several folks, including our State Bar Rules people, Supreme Court liaisons, and members of the working group. And what you're being asked to do today is to accept the revisions that have been drafted by the working group. This is not your commitment to, the, this is the proposal that we are gonna submit to the Supreme Court. So I would feel uncomfortable wordsmithing this because what you're, what you're changing, or I don't know if it's beyond wordsmithing, editing it, because what you're being asked to do is accept the recommendation from the working group. You could decide you don't want to accept their recommended revisions to 5.4, but I don't think we should try tinkering with their recommended revisions because it, it went through a lot of process to get to where it is. Well, I understand. I, I mean, I can accept that. Uh, I initially just flagged this because I thought it was confusing, but now I think I think if this were adopted, it would allow, like I said, licensed paraprofessionals to form a partnership with non-lawyers, which I'm sure is not intended, unless that prohibition is somewhere else in these rules. Isn't so it in D2? Yeah. yeah. Isn't it in D2? Right, because D2 is, is where it provided that you can't have an individual who's not a lawyer or paraprofessional having any interest. Okay, good. Thank you. So but my second substantive, if I'm kind of drafting slash substantive, is in the rest of these subdivisions, two, three, and four, I thought including lawyer didn't make sense because lawyers and paraprofessionals can't own a firm together. So that also was confusing. But maybe I'm missing something. And we don't, so Leah, we don't have um, Randy available. No, I just pinged him. So let me let me ask you this, Leah. I, I, I understand the concern about trying to draft here on the fly. And, um, well, and I'm just going to chime what in. What would the process I, be for, for considering this? I mean, is the working group completely done or could we delegate? I mean, I'm just a little concerned about these rules having unintended consequences. But, but Sean, what, I, what I'm saying is these rules are not um, nothing is happening with the rules right now. So I think what we okay. can do is just note your concern, make sure we address it when we go to the next step of finalizing rules. Because okay. just to step back, the, the program design has to ultimately be approved by the court and this, um, the legislature, and then rules that conform to what has ultimately been authorized need to be finalized. We, we may need wholesale revisions to the rules based on what ultimately gets authorized. And those rules will then have to go out for public comment. So it is at that phase that we will be th thinking about a final set of rules. Uh, we're not anywhere near there right now. Okay, that's, that's totally fine. So as long as it just goes into the hopper for consideration, uh, then I'm good. Okay. Thank you. Trustee Broughton, do you have a comment on this? Just quickly, if somebody who has a JD but has not been licensed by the state bar as an attorney, are they a lawyer under this rule? No. If you if you're not licensed as a lawyer, you can't you can't hold yourself out as a lawyer. No, I see Bra Louisa that Brady has his hand up in the attendees. I don't know if he is going to answer some of these rule questions. And if we could uh, take the take the red line off of the screen so that uh, at least I can see um, all of the attendees and the panelists. Thank you, I appreciate that. Yeah, we do have a, a raised hand, uh, Mr. Dewar from the Office of General Counsel. We're gonna promote you as a panelist.
or the hand went down. There you are. Hi, Brady. You're on mute. You're on mute. You're muted, Brady. I, I wanted to jump in real quickly to address Sean's question. I think that um, because the, the changes here were to D, that, that's what's been put up. But um, in the item, you'll see the full text of the rule 5.4, which tracks the attorney rule. And right in rule 5.4a, it makes clear that a licensed paraprofessional shall not share legal fees um, with a person who's not a lawyer or a licensed paraprofessional. So, so no, you can't share it with, with anybody. So it's, it's, it, it, it tracks the lawyer rule. And I think that we should remember the point that Leah made, which is essentially we're taking the working group's recommendations and, and deciding whether or not to move into the next step with them. Um, remembering, of course, that the issue that Sean raised does need to be examined at that next step, I think, or subsequently, quite frankly. Um, thank you, Brady, for, for your contribution. Any other questions or comments on the resolution itself? Trustee Tony. Thank you, uh, Chair Duran. Um, I very much liked the revision that the working group did to clarify that startup funds sh um, uh, are, should not be coming from or are prohibited coming from money that don't divert money from the discipline system, okay? And I got that, I support that. My concern remains that there, there should be no question of external money for this startup, period. No private funds are appropriate and certainly not stakeholder private funds that have self-interest. That, that, that constitutes a conflict of interest. And the way to avoid that is to make it clear that the expectation is that the startup costs need to be funded by the legislature. Um, I, I think that's the way out of it. I think it is appropriate to do. It's a very sound principle that the legislature should appropriate its mandates, period. Anytime they <laughs> mandate a, a new program to get started, that, that's just a basic principle. And I think it's a fair principle. And I, I think when you talk to most legislators, they will say, yes, that's a good principle. We hope we have the money, but it's a good principle. We agree with the principle. And I, I would like to see this resolution very clearly um, state that principle so that there's no confusion about going and asking for money from tech firms. That is a major, major mistake. Just speaking on behalf of the working group, uh, I, I, it was beyond our scope. It was not in our purview to make that policy uh, determination about making a statement that it must be publicly funded. I mean, I, I will say, Mr. Tony, I'm sure there are a number of people on the working group who would agree with what you just said, but we felt that our appropriate role as a working group was to take the position that however you all decide that this should be funded, however it gets funded, should be transparent. I appreciate that, uh, Justice Petru. I, I'm just suggesting that of what I want to see uh, sure. the modification to this uh, um, uh, um, uh, pr proposal uh, for my support. I, I want to support this. And I think what I'm asking for is, is doesn't undermine or weaken the proposal but uh, you know, makes it stronger by um, establishing a very clear principle. I would um, just, you know, that that's the board's policy call to make. I, I think uh, requiring uh, legislative funding is perhaps overly um, restrictive uh, in my view when we're looking for startup money. Um, we have, as an organization, been the benefit of funding from philanthropy over the years to do very good things here at the bar, including some of our early work um, to support records expungement activities. Um, philanthropy funds a, a lot of work in the legal services space. And so I, I would not want to see us be precluded um, from pursuing uh, those avenues. Uh, so that you know, the, again, sports policy call, but that would be my uh, caution. 
Uh, I'd like to jump in here with an observation as well. Um, the, the concept of a conflict of interest is a very specific legal question um, and can sometimes vary depending on the laws that you're working under, right? Uh, state bar rules versus the Political Reform Act, for example. So um, I am a little hesitant to inject that qualifier into the process at this stage, although I don't, I don't disagree with Trustee Tony that it's an issue that might, you know, that might merit some, uh, some, some consideration um, as we move, if we move forward. Um, I just don't know that, similar to what Trustee Seleg has raised, whether it's absolutely necessary to do so at this point, given um, that we are looking at the working group's recommendation sort of as a package as a whole and deciding whether or not to move forward with it um, as they've asked us to do, understanding that both the court, the board, and ultimately the legislature will have opportunities to, uh, to further massage and, and work on this program. Those are my, my initial thoughts. And I, I hesitate to get so involved in the debate sitting as the chair, but um, as a lawyer who works with conflicts of interest every day, uh, advising clients, I just wanna make that point. It, it, my only response is that conflict of interest has two components. One is a legal component. The other is a perceived conflict of interest. I think we have to be considerate of both. I accept that, sure. Trustees, any further questions or comments? Seeing none, I'm gonna ask that the resolution be put back up on the screen. And uh, if there's a motion one way or the other, I'd love to hear it. Hey, Sean, I'll move the item. Motion by Trustee Seleg, is there a second? This is Sonia. I second. Second by Trustee Delenn. Any further debate? Mr. Tony. Yes, I uh, would like to move an amendment to this resolution to add the, um, uh, to, to basically say um, with the expectation that the startup costs would be funded by the legislature. Uh, Mr. Seleg, as the original motion maker, you have the option to accept that as a friendly amendment. If not, we'll debate it and uh, see if Mr. Tony gets a second. I decline to accept. Look forward to the discussion. Okay, thank you. Is there a second on Mr. Tony's amended motion? Hearing none, uh, we'll go back to the original motion on the table. Madam Secretary, may I have a vote, please? Rotten? Yes. <clears throat> Chen? Yes. Cisneros? Aye. De La Cruz? Yes. Delenn? Yes. Seleg? Yes. Shelby? Aye. Sol? Aye. Stallings? Yes. Tony. Nay. Nine ayes, one nay. The motion carries. Thank you, trustees. Uh, Justice Petru and the entire working group, thank you all so very much for uh, quite, quite an amount of work and, and um, dedication to public service. We'll see where this goes from here. And on my behalf and on behalf of the uh, work group as a whole, thank you from all of us for giving us the opportunity to work on this. Um, we have very much, it hasn't been easy, but we've all appreciated and enjoyed it and hope that we have been of some assistance. So thanks to you all. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. We couldn't have done it without such a strong chair. I'll tell you that. <laughs> yeah. <Thank> you, <laughs> well, the chair is now going to go get some lunch, which I hope you all get to do as well at some point. Thanks, everybody. <laughs> Now you've made me hungry, Justice. <laughs> Bye. All righty. Uh, that takes us to item 710. Does the board uh, want to go straight to this, or would you, would you need a five or 10 minute break? How about a lunch break? How about a little? Yes. Lunch, lunch break? Lunch. Okay. Let's, let's break for uh, 33 minutes, bringing us back at 1.30. Thank you, everyone. We'll see you soon. Uh, reconvene. Meeting is now being recorded. Thank you, Madam Secretary. Okay, I'll reconvene the meeting of the Board of Trustees. Thank you everyone for um, allowing us a brief lunch break. We're gonna continue with our agenda.
And next up is item 710, which is the SB 211 case processing standards update. This is a presentation only. And um, Ms. Shang is presenting, I think, or is scheduled to present at least. Maybe we need to promote her to a panelist. She has been promoted. Good afternoon and welcome back, Ms. Shang. Good afternoon. The floor is yours. Thank you. All right, let me share my screen first. Can you see my screen? We can. Okay, so today George, Lisa and I will present our uh, progress in developing the new case processing standards. Uh, the update uh, today is based on the March meeting uh, we presented to RAD, Regulation and uh, Discipline Committee. When I, see, when I say we, I was not there, <laughs> but uh, Lisa and Ron in my division uh, co-presented with George uh, about the work developed uh, in March. And this is the update based on the work then. A quick overview of what needs to be done and the, what has been done. Uh, the four factors that are required to be taken into account in our new case processing standards by SB 211. Uh, some of you are very familiar with those four factors, mechanics of the discipline process. Uh, we used the three case processing stages intake, investigation, charging as an indicator of the mechanics of the discipline process, complexity of cases. We have complex and the non-complex uh, cases in our system. Uh, risk to public protection. Uh, in March, we talked about using a priority level P1, P2, P3. Uh, now we are in the process of re-evaluating this, uh, this indicator. Well, I will share more in the later slides. Uh, the last uh, factor, reasonable expectation of the public. In March, we talked about, uh, we conducted a survey. Uh, in this presentation, we will share the results of the survey. In addition to the four factors, uh, SB 211 also requires us to, uh, uh, the standards to reflect uh, the four areas. Uh, first one, state and national experts' opinion. Um, we have um, met with the three uh, experts we identified and shared in our March presentation. Uh, they reviewed our data and the conceptual uh, framework of our new uh, case processing standards. They will issue a report on, the fi on our final proposal. And the next section will focus, will, will focus on the uh, three areas report from the legislative analyst's office, reports from the uh, state auditor and review of uh, uh, case processing standards in other states. So before I go to the details of the updates, I, I want to share a little bit of um, my thought process here. Uh, in addition to presenting what our updated uh, standards are, I also want uh, in this presentation, share with you our uh, why we made those uh, updates and uh, uh, why we're in the process of making further adjustments. Uh, the, uh, the purpose is to build a strong and obvious link between the requirements by the, legislat by the legislators and the work we do and the uh, standards we propose. So by reviewing a 2019 Legislative Analyst Office report, those are our key takeaways. I'm not gonna read every line. You have the document. Uh, uh, I hope uh, the font size is readable. Uh, I just wanna say all those key takeaways identified by us are either have been uh, incorporated into our uh, case processing standards or are in the process of being incorporated in the, in, in the standards. I, I do want to highlight the last uh, bullet point here. Uh, the, the 2019 LAO report rec 
recognize the need for developing benchmarks for further improvements to address backlogs of discipline cases. Uh, this recommendation of developing benchmarks uh, was also um, mentioned in 2019 state audit report, uh, then this report, then 2021 report. So uh, one thing, one adjustment we are uh, considering making is to add the uh, benchmark metrics in our final uh, case processing standards. Uh, so, so that's one adjustment we are, we are considering. Um, so let me go to the details of 2021 state audit report. Um, I remember in one of the previous RAD meetings, uh, one of you, one of the board members, I, I, sorry, I don't remember exact who, raised a question. Uh, if our previously proposed standards were not embraced by the state auditor, how can we make sure this time standards will be well received? So, uh, so I just want to highlight 2021 state auditor report is where the state auditor uh, responded, uh, provided their responses to our previously proposed standards. So I want you know draw your special attention to this report. Uh, they talked a lot about uh, benchmarks. Uh, as I said, we we will incorporate. We are considering incorporating benchmarks into our final uh, standards. Uh, they put a lot of emphasis on backlog measure. We, we are developing our backlog measure right now. Uh, they talked about their preference for a single backlog figure, but they also mentioned they uh, uh, recognize they recognize different time frames uh, for different types of cases. Uh, then they talked about uh, staffing need analysis. Uh, we will not have the time to complete a workload study before October thirty first but we will add our plan for a uh, staffing need analysis in our final uh, 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 proposed standards. Then they also raised a question about our priority level. Any questions so far? Am I going too fast? Okay, all right. So uh, uh, 2022 state auditor report, um, the most relevant two takeaways identified uh, by me and George uh, are their emphasis on lengthy patterns of complaints. Uh, and uh, they went to the details of, uh, you know, patterns of complaints based on complaint type. So we are in the process of, of incorporating this, uh, uh, this um, uh, factor into our uh, case processing standards too. So some detailed updates we have made. Uh, first is uh, adjusting the priority level uh, categorize cases uh, as high risk and the low risk as the major indicator of uh, the factor risk to public protection. We think the, the, uh, the term is easier for the uh, legislators and the public to understand. And we are in the process of incorporating some of the bullet points we shared uh, previously into this uh, high risk and the low risk um, uh, differentiation. Then uh, another uh, key update we uh, are considering making, as I shared, we are uh, considering uh, including uh, benchmarks uh, into, our, uh, 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 into our framework of the case processing standards. Uh, I want to point out right now, we already developed a weekly operational report. Uh, however, I, I, I do, my observation is that the weekly operational report is not tightly linked with the case processing standards framework. So there is some you know, gap there we, that the interim benchmark will serve as a interim checking point that we can uh, know either monthly or quarterly how we perform uh, in, uh, in terms of uh, reaching our uh, performance goals. Then the next uh, major area that the uh, uh, that SB two eleven requires us to uh, consider is other states' case processing standards. I will give you a minute to quickly read this table. So our major observation is that first they. Uh, use the case processing stages 
as the main kind of uh, uh, types of uh, uh, pro case processing standards um, uh, timeframes, which is consistent with our uh, current time, current conceptual work is that we have three case processing stages, intake, investigation, and the charging. Another um, major observation is that they all use the average time as the basis of developing their uh, timeframes. Uh, so we are adjusting, we are exploring basing case processing standards on average time rather than median as we uh, shared in March uh, presentation. Um, however, we are still uh, going to report median and the average in our annual discipline report per, uh, per S, uh, SB 211. Uh, so that's some adjustment uh, we we are uh, considering making. Another thing is, if you look at the table, some key statistics are missing, uh, which are number of staff members involved in the disciplinary system, number of complaints received, number of pending investigations at the end of the fiscal year. So we will add those key statistics uh, into the table, and so that when we uh, develop when we develop our final time frame, we can uh, really do the apple to apple comparisons or benchmarks. So the last uh, uh, information source is public survey results. So in March presentation, we talked about, we conducted a survey. Uh, we distributed this survey to both uh, public and OCTC staff. Uh, in this survey, we have three uh, factual scenarios. We asked the respondents to rate the complexity level and the uh, uh, case process, estimated case processing time. And uh, not surprised, there is a constant gap, no matter which you know complexity level we look at, uh, between the OCTC staff's uh, time estimation in months in the unit in the unit of months. Uh, and the uh, general public's estimation of time. However, they all, both groups recognize that, you know, the more complex the case, the case is, the more time it requires. So the next step for this is that we are uh, um, uh, conducting uh, several focus groups based on case types and uh, trying to understand uh, the more de more details about the specific time uh, in case process in, in the in case processing uh, framework. All right. Before I hand uh, the presentation to Lisa, any questions so far? All right, Lisa, go ahead. Okay. Can you uh, go to the next slide? Hello, everyone. So here's the um, overall. Uh, uh, path forward and how we're going to develop the standards. Um, as you can see, there is five key steps, but let's, so I'm going to walk you through them. Uh, so the starting point is to generate as is standards. And that is like right now, if you look at all our different categories, how long does it take to close cases? Next, we, do, we d conducted an analysis where we adjust those time standards to explain for, to adjust for unexplained time gaps. And uh, we're going to explain what that methodology is in a few slides later. Um, once we have that set of uh, little set of standards, again, one for each of our categories, that's when we consider what we learned from our other six states. We hear our experts' thoughts on what the time standards are shaping up to look like. We consider all the information we received from the LEO and auditor reports, and of course, our uh, public survey results. And then we adjust again, that's in step two. Next, then we will share those standards that we generate with OCTC staff and we'll conduct focus groups. And in particular, we'll ask them questions like, um, under normal circumstances, what accounts for the amount of time to, it takes to process different cases, these different types of categories that we're considering, um, these gaps that we've identified, what do you think explains them, et cetera. And then we will, based on that, those conversations, we will produce a final set of, set of two B, what, we're, what we call 2B standards. These are the standards that we propose that we be held accountable for. And that's, that's step four. 
And uh, once we have that, then we'll generate staffing requirements. As you said, that we're going to shift that project into later uh, next year. So, uh, so far we have completed, uh, we'll start, we've completed step one and step two. And that's where we're gonna share today. Okay, next slide. So just as a reminder, at, last, at your last meeting, we shared our previous typology. We had eight categories of cases that we were going to develop standards for. This was the slide we shared last time. So I'm just sharing with you as a reminder of this is what we shared last time. Um, and we're gonna show what we've changed it to. Go ahead to the next slide. So as you and said, we're gonna, we've updated that framework, again, that typology that we shared, and now we're considering just really four categories. Again, nothing's changed with regards to the stage. Of course, complexity is still there. And instead we're using on the right here, you see risk to public protection. We're just having a category of high risk versus low risk before we were looking at P1, P2, P3 cases. So now it's just high risk or low risk, high risk or the P1 cases. And we're gonna expand that a bit to consider uh, previous patterns of complaints. And then down here on the left, it's just case expedition. This is kind of like a new category and that's just P2 cases, which will have their own set of standards. Okay, next slide. And so now remember those eight categories on the previous slide, we've consolidated them into six categories. So now the categories are right here. There's categories, these are cases that close an intake, expedited cases that close an investigation, high risk cases that are non-complex that close an investigation. Number four is high risk cases that are complex, close an investigation. Five are low risk cases that close an investigation and six are all cases that make it to the charging phase and close there. Okay, so thank you. Uh, now, I think George is presenting from here on forward. Yes, so basically um, tying these back to the eight categories we had before, um, intake is still intake, the expedited was what was P2. Um, the P1s, which are the high risk ones, remain differentiated by complexity. Um, we've combined all of the P3 cases into one category, the low risk investigations, so they're no longer differentiated on complexity. Um, and we've combined the charging, um, so that now includes both P1 and P3 cases. Um, and that's the approach we're going to take both to simplify and because it appears consistent with um, kind of the data we've looked at in some of the standards in other states and other places. Um, so you can see some facts about each of those categories here. Um, and importantly, on the left, you'll see um, Duane mentioned um, average and median, which we plan to report both. You'll note that in this, um, the median times, um, which is what was we showed last time in March, you can see that the averages in each of those is higher. Um, that's in fact because what's driving the averages higher is most likely a set of small number of cases at the tail end of the distribution that are taking longer times and are driving the averages up as compared to the medians. Um, so that's kind of where we are. Let's go to the next slide. Um, so what we did to kind of arrive at, if we think about the two sets of standards we're proposing, um, the as is standards is basically what we could do now with our current resources. In other words, it's based on historical data with some procedural adjustments to kind of make procedural tweaks, but without the addition of significant resources. When we look at the 2B standards, what we're trying to look at is if we had, so I'll take an ideal world, let's say we had all the staffing we wanted, cases would still say take some period of time. And so we would come up with a set of times that a case would take if we had all the staffing we needed or all the staffing ideally we wanted. That's what we're trying to come up with the 2B standards. In other words, assuming that we got some increase in resources that was reasonable, what would that do? And what would be a set of case processing times that we could mesh if those times weren't significantly slowed down by investigators and attorneys having excessive caseloads? Um, and so to, to look at that, what we looked at was we looked at our cases and we found diving kind of into the cases that a number of our cases had um, unexplained gaps. In other words, when we look at our case process, our case management system, we would see gaps between events um, that were unexplained. In other words, it wasn't time waiting for things. It was just that there were times when the cases appeared to lie fallow and nothing was being done. And so the hypothesis is that that is the result of attorneys and investigators basically having divert their attention from that case to other cases 
and not being able to get back and do the things that would be necessary on that case because of these things here, their caseloads, um, not enough time forced to allocate their time among a larger number of cases than they should with the result that they're sitting for some period of time. So to try and work that into our analysis, we looked at numbers of cases. Can we go to the next slide? We looked at adjusting our case age by removing any unexplained times that exceeded 60 days. In other words, anything that sat fallow for longer than 60 days, we're gonna remove the time over 65 days, and this is over 60 days. And this is an example of, of how we went about doing that. So the theory is that this would give us an adjusted time for each case that would be the time that would be an ideal time if in fact it wasn't laying fallow as a result of investigators or attorneys having excessive case loads. So using that, we came up with, if we can go to the next slide, um, this table, which is basically our work conducted to date. So the as-is standards here, the starting point is basically the as-is standards, which is essentially what we showed you in March, but converted now from a median to an average. Um, so now we're looking at the as-is standards in terms of average as opposed to median. Then we adjusted those times by removing all of the gaps that were above 60 days to come up with these adjusted um, averages. Um, and then we took a first cut at kind of looking at some of the other data we have, um, the public survey results, um, some information about the other states that was displayed to you before, which also report as averages, um, the California Healing Arts Boards, which also report as averages, um, and some information that we had from the 2016 backlog study and adjusted it to say, okay, um, if we look at the 60 day gap adjusted data and we factor in all these other things, these appear to be tentative 2B standards that would be consistent with all of that information. And you can see that these are averages. So, so what we are tentatively thinking of is basically 30 days for intake, um, 90 days for expedited investigations, our P2 cases, 120 days for our high-risk non-complex investigations, 180-day average for our high-risk complex investigations, 210 for low-risk, and then looking at charging because feeding into charging will be all of these other cases, so things that have gotten through investigation, which in what may be very different cases of time, looking at charging is just on average that should take 90 days from whenever the case gets into charging. Um, so this is kind of tentatively what we're looking at. Um, the plan is to take this out, um, have this reviewed by people in OCTC who work these types of cases to get in accordance with what the legislative analyst and state auditor have, have both recommended in the past, a Delphi analysis based on focus groups to get the people who actually work these cases to look at um, how the cases are worked and ratify the reasonableness of these standards. Um, then do a final adjustment and come back with what we hope will be our final proposed 2B standards. So I think with that, we're going to go to the next slide, which I think you mean is going to take. Okay, I just want to quickly share our project timeline. Uh, so today, May 20, our update here, then we will need to write our final proposal and uh, submit proposal to RAD in July. Uh, in the meantime, solicit public comment, um, submit to, between July and September, submit our proposal to uh, le legislative analyst office for feedback. This September, we will make some uh, revisions and revised proposal will be submitted to RAD. Uh, we all know October 31st is the final deadline for the uh, uh, proposed, uh, uh, fine, uh, for the uh, case processing standards. Uh, we do want to add the uh, kind of uh, um, workload study. Uh, that plan, that analysis plan will be part of the uh, final case processing standards. Uh, and we will uh, uh, mention that we will conduct a workload study in, uh, in uh, 2023 spring, and uh, we will have the final report hopefully in June 2023 and submit our proposed for staffing re requirements. That's it. Thank you. Ruben, if I could just say a couple things. Um, sure. One, I want to, I hope that the board uh, takes away from this. Um, one, it's been a tremendous uh, amount of work that's going into this. 
Uh, but two, there really is, with a great deal of intentionality, a focus on all of the feedback we previously received from the legislative analyst, from the auditor, uh, paying close attention to the requirements of SB 211. And the goal here, of course, is to develop case processing standards that are accepted, not rejected by the legislature. So I want to make that really clear. That's what we're doing. And I want to really um, recognize and appreciate you, Wayne. This is her third week on the job. And I think uh, having somebody from the outside come in and look at all of these reports has been quite helpful. Um, to all of us. So one is, you know, we're just making a lot of effort to be responsive to the feedback we've received. The other is I wanted to pick up on that last slide. We are proposing to do a workload study next year. That means that the case processing standards will not be submitted with a request for funding for new positions to implement the standards. It means the request for funding would trail uh, because the re funding request would be uh, the product or the workload study would be used to generate that need. And that's something George and I have talked about um, quite a bit and feel confident that it's uh, the right approach is to bifurcate development of the standards and then articulation of the resources needed to implement them. But I want to make sure that I'm making that explicitly clear uh, to the board because that's not how we've done this previously. Thank you, Leah. And thank you, George, Lisa, and Nguyen for the presentation. Are there any uh, questions by any members of the board on what we perceived? Questions or comments? Mr. Sowell. First of all, I just want to thank folks for uh, sort of the comprehensiveness of, uh, of the presentation. Uh, and I think the responsiveness to what it is that we need to respond to relative to the uh, the audit reports, the LAO reports, and sort of the path that we're sort of carving going forward. Leah, I, um, uh, if you would just sort of talk just a little bit more, I wanted just to make sure I uh, really was clear on what you just said on how the, the resource piece may lag here and, uh, and wondering what that sort of lag time might, might be. Okay, so... Um... The, what the practical effect of, of what we're uh, proposing would be is that the caseload standard or the yeah the caseload standard case processing standards would be submitted to the legislature in the fall of 2022, perhaps to be codified in the 2023 fee bill. But if we complete the workload study in um, you know spring summer of 2023. The earliest we could hope to see any revenue or licensing fee adjustment to support the workload study results would be 2024. So you're talking about a one-year lag. And um, I'll, I'll be happy to turn this over to George as well. But I think there, there, it, we want to be really confident when we ask for more resources to implement these standards. We wanna be confident that if we get them, we're actually able to implement the standards. And I think uh, George feels that there, there's some work to do uh, in his office to get there. And I think that's, I, I just think it's the right approach, but it, but it is different than what we've done in the past. And George, I, I don't know if you wanna elaborate at all. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I agree with that. I mean, we've, uh, we've been working with people in Neem's office to try and identify how we're going to arrive at a staffing level once we have the standards. In other words, what we'll need to do is define the number of staff that would be needed to reach that level. Um, that's harder than it sounds, um, looking at the data and trying to figure out. Um, in the past, we've been criticized by both the legislative analyst's office and the state auditor for not having done a thorough enough work to demonstrate the connection between increased staff and the ability to move cases more quickly. And so I just, I don't see a possibility of having that done in time to have it submitted by October, given that we don't have the standards that we're trying to move to. And that was part of the criticism in the past that we were doing um, workload studies based on um, standards that weren't yet in place so that we were or old standards such that the workload study didn't relate to what we were setting as our goals. So I think we need to clearly have in place what our goals are and then do the workload study and have the documentation to support whatever we we put in so that we're not in the same position that we've been criticized for in the past. 
So I, I appreciate both your comments. And I think the only thing that I, as I'm thinking about this and I understand the chronology uh, uh, and how this is uh, going to unfold is the revenue stream that the sale of the building presents and uh, which would be a revenue stream that would be sooner than what it is that we're, or potentially sooner than what it is that we're talking about and how that might factor into this. And I don't necessarily know if I, I'm looking for a response, but just simply the fact that, uh, just sort of airing the fact that there, there potentially could be uh, a revenue stream that could, could uh, avail itself sooner, uh, but we may not be in a position to actually uh, attach ourselves to that revenue stream. Well, I think um, certainly discussions about what, what we will be a, allowed to do with the proceeds from the sale of the building, as you know, that we're, we're hoping that those are underway soon. And this, this could be an option on the table. Thank you, everyone. Uh, Mr. Selig. Thank you. Um, could, could whoever is controlling the PowerPoint put back up that slide toward the end that had the proposed um, time frames on it? I think it's the one before this. Thank you. So, okay, George, I have, a, this is a dumb question because I'm sure you've said this already. These, so we're proposing, uh, so column two is what we're proposing to be the statutory standard. And is that something, is that based on what we can achieve with today's resources or is that? No, that would be so something that we, could achieve with increased staffing. In other words, the, the way to look at this, I think, is um, the as-is standards is what we think we could achieve with our current resources. The um, column two um, is what we think we could achieve with increased staffing levels that would be sufficient to basically eliminate the time lags that result from um, investigators and attorneys having excessive caseloads coupled with procedural improvements in how we handle cases. Okay, thank you. And then, so in column two, uh, well, I'll, I'll tell you, the, the thought went through my mind whether four and five are too long, but so much thought has go, gone into this. Um, I'm not questioning it. I just, <clears throat> you know, you've got six months and then, <clears throat> I can't do my math, two, ten must be like seven or eight months. But um, but I, the thing that really caught my eye is item six charging that would take 90 days? Why would that take 90 days? I mean, isn't that at the point where you're simply drafting an NDC? And I, I know you're probably including time for the ENEC. Yeah, so that I'm sure I'm missing something. What am I missing? So yeah, that, that time includes drafting the NDC, um, drafting a charging memo, um, conducting the ENEC, um, and engaging in any further process. And if there is a resolution, it would also include um, preparing, negotiating, and drafting a stipulation to resolve the case. Hmm. I guess my honest reaction to that is it seems too long, and I don't know that it's going to play well. So that's just my, it seems like a long time to do those and, and that's one of the reasons that I want to emphasize that that column is tentative. Um, we are still, for example, as Eileen mentioned, we're still waiting to get more data from some of the states. Um, and similarly, we're trying to look at some more of the data for California's own boards and differentiate that data. The problem is that many of these boards and states um, don't report data that's differentiated the same ways that we're proposing. So we're trying to sort out how to address that and, and, and get a more realistic look at what has to be done. All right, thank you. Mr. Tony. Thank you, uh, Chair Duran. Um, I really like this uh, revised categorization of, um, of the uh, cases. Um, I think there's a, a lot of rationality to it. And I, I, I like having the different days associated with different steps of the process. I think that's very useful. Um, this is just a comment and suggestion for when you're looking at the staffing uh, survey need assessment. This process works best, a new process 
with new cases as they come in, right? New cases that are day zero because they just came in. And I can see uh, you being able to come up with a, you know, for un, you know, new cases under the new set of rules, what's the staffing need? I think there will need to be additional staffing needs for the backlog of everything that's come in before that time. And just want you to keep, keep in mind that your initial request may need, uh, because it needs to clear up a backlog, may need to be more than your routine staffing needs that whose goal is to prevent a backlog from occurring in the first place. That's it. Thank you, Mr. Tony. Trustees, any other questions or comments? Okay, everyone, thank you for the comprehensive presentation. We look forward to seeing how this further develops. Thank you for your work. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, it takes us to the end of our open session business, if I'm not mistaken. I don't see anybody trying to tell me otherwise. We will uh, move into closed session under the authority of the following government code sections. 1126 sub E sub one, 1126 sub A, 11126 sub A sub one, and 11126 sub C sub seven. We have no public comment for closed session and you all should have or will receive shortly a link for our closed session. We will come out um, at the end of closed session to report whether or not there is any reportable action. Thank you everyone, we'll see you in closed session. Okay, we are now recording. Great, thank you. I will restate what I said. Uh, we are waiting for trustees to bounce back into the open session meeting after having completed the closed session agenda as posted on our, uh, our website. The board considered uh, each of the items that are listed on that closed session agenda, but made uh, no reportable action. Um, and so with that, I will adjourn the board of trustees meeting and hand, uh, hand the gavel as it were over to vice chair Stallings to make an announcement about the next meeting to be convened. All right, thank you. All right, so I'm going to reconvene the general counsel search committee. It was adjourned uh, from earlier today. Uh, so I will make a renewed call for public comment. And Louisa, do you see anybody who um, is attending that has raised their hands? I do not see any members of the public with their um, wanting to make public comment. All right, and so at this point, we'll go in, back into closed session from the recon or from the adjourned meeting. Um, pursuant to government code section 11126 sub A sub one. And so members of the search committee access the closed session agenda using the link that Louisa sent for um, the regular board of trustees closed session. Thanks everyone. Have a good weekend. Have a good weekend. Thank you, sir.